Welcome, Head Royce audience. This is our second interview with a notable alumnus. Um, and we are broadcasting to our K-12 community. So to all lower schoolers, middle schoolers, wow. and upper schoolers out there, welcome. Um, our guest today is Dan Wu, and he is Head Royce class of 1992 and a very creative and engaging guy who has had an incredible career so far in film and television. Dan is the son of a college professor, his mom, an engineer, his dad, both of whom are from Shanghai. And Dan himself is an East Bay native born in Berkeley, California, who attended Head Rice from seventh grade until his senior year. Beginning at the age of 11, Dan began studying uh, the martial art form of Wushu after seeing a Jet Li movie that inspired him. And after Head Royce, Dan went on to college at the University of Oregon, where he studied architecture. And then uh, also at the University of Oregon, he formed the first Wushu club there. Um, when he graduated, it was around 1997, he was curious to see Hong Kong being turned over from Great Britain to the People's Republic of China, went to Hong Kong, uh, became a model, I believe, at the urging of his two older sisters. And from there was discovered by a film director who placed Dan in Dan's very first feature film, which went well because since that first film, Dan Wu has acted, produced, directed, or helped to write over 70 films. Uh, many of those films are within the Chinese language film industry. Um, some of them coming out of Hollywood too. And for those films, he has been, uh, he's been awarded with wonderful accolades from both Hong Kong and Taiwan film festivals. Uh, recently, Dan has spent more time in Hollywood and he is the executive producer of and uh, lead actor within a wonderful television series called Into the Badlands. Um, and he was also recently in Tomb Raider. So I wanna just show quickly to the audience um, some clips from Dan's film. I think I know where my dad went. That's right in the middle of the Devil's Sea. It will be an adventure. Death is not an adventure. And now you get to see the beautiful 1968 Honda that uh, Dan and his one of his best friends from Head Royce got a chance to work on. And finally, what I was trying to show you before, which I'm more successfully showing you now, Dan's yearbook page where his friends believed he was gonna become a traffic cop. He did not know what the future would hold, but we are so delighted that his future took him into film and has brought him to us. And I want to briefly uh, tell you the three student interviewers we have here today. We have Chloe Beidel, who is a senior, an actor, and somebody who speaks Mandarin quite well. We have Kaylin Beckford, who is a junior, an actor, and one of the captains of our dance troupe. And Lucas Dodson, another senior broadcast journalist, um, who is also a car enthusiast. And last but not least, we have Barry Barankin, Dan's former English teacher and maybe drama teacher from Head Royce. So I'm just gonna throw you, Dan, the first question, which is, what were you like as a child? What, <laughs> what was I like as a child? I, I think other people could probably describe it better, but I think I was a, a um, pretty hyperactive, pretty all over the place child um, uh, and pretty naughty, I think, yeah. Um, I wasn't the best of students. I wasn't the um, um, most popular of kids, but uh, it all worked out in the end. <laughs> so good. And I'm going to now hand it over to Kaylin to, to ask a question. Um, I was wondering if you did theater in, in high school. I did not do theater in high school. In fact, I... It took me a while to kind of get out of my shell, and it probably wasn't until out after college, in fact. So I had done some things at Head Royce, um, but I was mostly like a stagehand. I made props. I like doing behind the scenes things. 
And I studied architecture because I was looking for a way to express myself, but I knew I wasn't at that time, I wasn't like an in, in front of the camera kind of guy or an actor type of person. And so the way I expressed myself was through the things I made, the drawings, um, sculptures and things like that. And that's why I chose architecture as a profession. So I hadn't, in Head Royce, I hadn't come out of my shell yet. I wasn't bold enough to perform um, until much later. I did do one thing though for Barry, Mr. Barankin, um, for a class we did on American history and it was called Indians, right, um, Barry? And it was, a, it was a book and I played Geronimo. Yeah, Indians, it's a play by yeah. Arthur Coppett. Right, and in the play, there's a scene from, uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, was it Wild Bill had a circus? Yeah, well, it's, it's Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill had a circus and he had Geronimo, the famous Native American warrior. Was he playing himself in that circus? Yeah. Right, and then he did this ceremony, which was like this piercing of the skin um, ceremony, and I played Geronimo for that scene. And it's ironic because now, in the world, as my film career started, I've been playing a lot of villain type characters that are villains or bad guys, but the audience has empathy for them. And this Geronimo character was that kind of character actually in, 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 in its essence, you know, perceived as a bad guy, but actually he was not. Um, and, I, and it was a pretty extreme character because I remember we actually had to do the ceremony. I put on a nude t-shirt, a nude colored t-shirt and pretended to pierce my skin with these hooks and then pass out. Oh, and I also had testicles around my neck because Geronimo collected testicles, right? The, the people that he scalped. So we had this thing that Mr. Franken told me to make, which was a nylon with walnuts in it around my neck. And then this t-shirt where I pierced my skin and then passed out on the floor. So that was a, a foreshadowing of what my uh, career would be to come. And just so you know, I take full credit for your film career. Yeah, you should actually. <laughs> Because I remember, I really remember clearly while I was performing it, you were looking at me, you were giving back an intensity in your eyes that was equaling the intensity that I was giving. So it gave me confidence in the performance. And in, in many years since then, I realized like that's how I need to find my performances. Sometimes I have to look to my other actors and see what's coming from their eyes to give me the power to do my performance. And so I very, very clearly remember that moment. Um, because it was actually my first time to ever perform in front of anybody, really. Did you like that moment enough where you thought to yourself, there might be something in this for me? Or was it just a, a, a kind of a fleeting and unexpected experience? Let's say a seed was planted there that I didn't know was going to grow into that much year, many years later. But, but it did, because like I said, I was able to remember that experience and use that in my professional life. Dan, didn't you also perform some wushu for at a morning meeting? Uh, I don't think I did it at a morning meeting. I did it years later. I came back to Head Royce. Uh, yeah. um, after I had gone, to, in 1994, I went to China to train in wushu for three months with the Beijing wushu team. Um, and I came back from that trip and I, it was my, I've given two talks to Head Royce and that was the first one. And it was just about wushu and we brought a team over, we performed and um, spoke to the school about what Wushu was. And that was like right when Crouching Tiger came out. So that was really popular at the time. Thank you. Yeah. Chloe, did you do anything theater related or film related while you were in college that maybe, I don't know, started something there? So yeah, I did take, I took film classes in college. As part of my major is architecture, it's, a, it's an arts degree. So we were able to take electives in other courses and film was one of them. So I took uh, international film, uh, French cinema, and Italian cinema. Um, so there's three different projects I did. And I wrote, for my international cinema project, I wrote a 10-page thesis on the work of John Woo as a director. And 10 years later, I worked with, for him as he, as he was a producer on a film I did. So kind of interesting, kind of ironic. At that time, I had still had no idea that I'd be getting into the film business. It was something... I'd always been interested in movies and since a young kid, like movies were a big thing for me. Um, and I've always been interested in filmmaking. And so when I was studying architecture, I said, decided to study some filmmaking as well because I thought, oh, they're very similar uh, uh, forms of expression, just different medium. So I wanted to study film to see, to learn more about it. And that's what I did, but I never did acting, never got into acting, yeah. 
again, at that time, I still thought of myself as a maker that was more behind the scenes and not someone that would be in front of the camera. So I guess the obvious question is, how, what made you transition from being a behind the scenes guy to a icon in front of the camera? So I was literally thrown into it. Um, you know, it's, it seems like, and I'll, I never tell actors this story because they hate it, because most actors struggle for five, 10 years before they get their chance and then they get into the business, right? Whereas for me, um, I had no plans to get into the film business. I had graduated from University of Oregon, 1997 in architecture. I knew that I wasn't going into the field of architecture because um, I wanted to do a really creative profession. That's why I studied architecture in school with 99% creative, but I had done five internships while I was in college and I realized the profession wasn't as creative as school made it seem. And so I was like, okay, I'm, that's fine, but I'm going to maybe move into some field that's not architecture or maybe architecture related, but is more creative. I just wanted to have something with uh, a lot of creative energy. And so I went to Hong Kong for my high college graduation trip. That was in 1997. I planned to travel around for two or three months and then figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Um, and I thought about maybe being a set designer for films. I thought about being a graphic designer. I thought about all these different things. And while I was getting ready to leave uh, Hong Kong because I'd ran out of money, my budget, I think at the time I only had $2,000 to spend on this whole trip. Um, I got approached by somebody in a bar to, to uh, they scouted me to be, if I wanted to be in a TV commercial. And I was like, TV commercial? Okay, what do I need to do? And they're like, oh, you just need to do this and this is for a bank and you just need to go shopping. I'm like, okay, um, does it pay? And she's like, yeah. I go, how much? And she's like, $4,000. I was like, my eyes lit up. I'm like, okay, well, that can extend my trip. So I, again, at that point, I still wasn't thinking of being an actor. I was just doing, doing something that could extend this, this um, vacation I was taking or trying to figure out my life. So I did that ad. I kept traveling around Asia. And then a month into it, a director saw the ad, ad that came out and he liked it a lot. He called me into his office for an interview and I went in and we talked for about an hour and a half. I didn't audition. I walked out. Um, two hours later, he calls me and he goes, okay, I want you to play the lead in my film. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, I said, I've never acted before. Cantonese was not my, not a language I knew how to speak at the time. I spoke Mandarin and Chinese at home. And so I said, I don't think I can do this for you. And I turned it down. And then for about a month, every other day, he kept calling me saying, I know you can do this. I know you can do this. And at the end of it, I go, okay, look, I, the reason why I turned it down is because exactly why I took film, cl I took film classes in school. And I go, you know, making movies is not fun and games. And you're putting all your chips on me. You're gambling on someone that's never acted before and doesn't speak the language fluently. That's crazy. Like I would never hire that person. So that I turned myself down for him. And so after that month of him calling every other day, I said, look, if you don't blame me for it being bad in the end, I'll give it a shot, but I just don't want to have that pressure. Okay. And he goes, no, 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 it'll be fine. And so, uh, we had about two or three months to prepare. Um, luckily I lived about a block away from his office. So I was in the office every day and this is how I decided to build the character. And Mr. Rankin, you're probably gonna laugh at this. Chloe, you're probably gonna laugh at this. But I didn't know anything about acting at the time. I'd had that one experience with, in Mr. Brankin's class, and that was it. And so I said, okay, a person is like a building. I know buildings because I studied architecture, right? Their backstory is like the foundation, like their history, where they came from, who they, where, where, they, where they were born, what kind of parents they had. That's the foundation of the building that, the, that it sits on, right? And then the structure of the building is who they are as a person, right? And then their skin, the skin of the building, whether it's glass or wood or whatever, is the the skin is the outside of this person what they're trying to present to the world what they want the world to see them as right and so i started to break it down a character as a building that way and i told my director i'm like i'm i'm using this method to sort of understand this character do you think that is okay and he goes well i've never heard anybody do that before but it sounds like you have a process and so why don't you stick with that and so I stuck with it. And to this day, 20 something years later, I still kind of use that format to, to uh, approach a character. So That's yeah, fine. To, answer your, to answer your question, I'd had no experience and all I could do is draw, draw from what I knew. 
And architecture school was a great foundation for coming up with a creative process, right? How do you get an idea out of your head and bring it to fruition? So that could be anything from a design of a building to like a business plan. I want to do a business, you know, I want to do this kind of business. What are the process that, what are the steps you need to take that to make that happen? A lot of people have great ideas, but they don't know how to execute and turn that into something. So then the idea just dies and it doesn't become anything. And so for me, I was like, okay, I understand a production process of a building. I can apply that to acting. And then I can apply that to a bunch of other things. So when we talk about my cars later, I can say, I mean, I use that same process late to design cars. And, you know, my whole life actually has not necessarily been um, trying to achieve or become the best actor I can be, but it's actually become the most creative person I can be. So I've always been on this sort of creative journey. And for me, acting, designing, uh, writing, all that kind of stuff is all the same kind of creative pot. Okay, students, another question. Um, what were some of the most difficult moments that you remember from maybe your early film career and kind of what did you learn from them? Yeah. Okay, so the first film I knew nothing and that was almost better because, you know, the famous saying, ignorance is bliss, right? So I went into it not knowing anything. I, I designed this character based on a building and then I didn't know the language. So that was a really important part of this process that I had to learn lines in a foreign language that I didn't really speak. I'd understood Cantonese uh, growing up because I watched a lot of Hong Kong films and I could speak a little tiny bit, but Cantonese, Mandarin and Shanghai dialect, even though they're all Chinese, it's completely different. It's like Portuguese, Spanish and Italian. You, you can get some of it, you know, but you're not gonna get 100%. The structure grammar is all the same, but the way you pronounce the words is completely different. The way you use your mouth is completely different. So Cantonese was a challenge. And so every night for that three months, I recorded all my dialogue on tape. This is this is the 90s. We still had tape then um, and kept and just played it back and repeated it over and over and over again. I knew the meaning of the word. So it wasn't like I was just making up sounds. I knew the meaning. And so I was able to understand what I was saying, but I just memorized my dialogue through this like recording and playing back process just repetition 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 and finally got it that way um and i i would say that was difficult but i didn't know what any better so that was the way i went later on as i started doing more movies i started to learn how to analyze myself and then i learned to self-loathe and hate myself and so that was <laughs> difficult too because i would you know i'd do a movie and i'd like watch it after we'd be done and like, ah, oh, oh, I could have done so much better in that scene. I wish I did better in that scene. So the first five years I was still learning how to act and I still am today, 25 years later, I'm still learning. It's still it, acting is or anything creative. You never stop learning. You just keep growing and growing and growing. You just keep getting better and better with age. Um, and so that, but that first five years, it was embarrassing because I'm learning, but then my product is being put out there for an audience to see my whole process. Right. Um, and so actually my first film was much better than my second, third or fourth film because I didn't, wasn't conscious of it. When I became conscious of what I was doing, I became self-conscious and then I, you know, didn't do as well. And it took a while, it took, like I said, like four or five years to finally kind of let go and let that creative process flow. And this is the thing about acting or anything creative. If you think too much about it, it's not gonna be that great. You gotta let it just flow out of you. And I also like to equate it with like sports, like a golf swing, like if anybody plays golf, you know, if you start thinking about your swing while you're about to swing, you're going to screw up for sure, right? You have to do all that work, legwork beforehand. And then when you get on the green, you take that swing and you feel it. You just feel it and you know it. Um, and that's the same thing with acting. It's like when you when you completed a scene and, it's been, and it was good, you feel it inside. You know it was good inside and you don't really have to analyze it. You don't even have to watch the playback to know. Did to swing um, with a language that's not your native language. So to use the golf swing uh, metaphor here, to swing with Cantonese when you're not a native speaker, did that ever get fluid? Did that ever feel like you could get into that Zen moment with a language that you didn't grow up speaking? Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, it took about five years. So it was this process of learning a language and also learning a craft at the same time. Um, and then about five years into it, I started to feel really comfortable. And now Cantonese, out of all the three, is my most comfortable uh, language because I lived in Hong Kong for so long. Um, Mandarin became much more important later on as we moved into the China film industry. The China uh, 
uh, world and started doing man movies in Mandarin. So my, but my Mandarin was pretty solid before then. So it was really just the Cantonese. But it, yeah, it was very difficult because trying to emote in a language that's not your own is so difficult. And then trying to emote in a language that is tonal is very difficult because in English, we, we emote through changing the tone of words. Right. But if you do that in Chinese, you change the, the meaning of the words. So it's like I had to learn how to be almost a different person in some ways because of all of all those, you know, that baggage that comes along with the language. Can you give an example of that, Dan? Uh, OK, like so in Mandarin, ma is horse. Ma is ma, mom, right? Ma is mad at someone, right? Those, those are just three tones, right? And so Chloe can probably attest to that. That's three. In Cantonese, there's nine tones. So your margin of error is that much more, right? And um, yeah, I don't know if I should say this example because, but let's just say that I had a line one time where I had to say, this dog is not mine. <laughs> That's how you say it in Cantonese. But what I said was, that bad word is not mine. Um, and the, I, the whole crew starts laughing and I didn't understand why because the tone was just off by a little bit. So the real word is gao, is dog, right, in Cantonese, which is go in Mandarin, right? But the bad word I said in Cantonese is gao. I'm not going to translate it for you guys because there's kindergartners up here or middle, lower schoolers up here, so I won't do that. But, but um, it's a bad word. And so I had a learning curve like that where I had to deal with, you know, you know being self-conscious about speaking the wrong words as well as uh, learning the craft. Um, so you not, not only do you act in films, you also produce and have written some, I think. Mm -hmm. right? and, directed. and directed. Yeah. So how did you get into the different those different roles and what what are the differences and kind of what do you prefer to do? Great question, because I have that in my notes I want to talk about. Um, so I would say about five years into acting, once I felt comfortable with that, you know, being on set all the time, you see how a movie is made and you understand you start to learn a lot. I mean, not everybody is like that. Some people just come to set, do their work, go home, you know? And I was very interested in the whole process. And and I would have to, have to go back, backtrack a little bit. When I got onto the set of my first movie, and, you know, I was saying that I was looking for a creative environment. The first day on set of that first movie, I saw all the crews, like the lighting crew setting up and the, the set designers setting set up things and the cameraman setting stuff up. And there's this buzz and this energy. And I was like, yes, this is where I want to be. This is the environment I want to be in. This is the creative energy that I've been searching for for 20 something years, 21 years. Um, and so from that moment, I decided I want to be an actor. I want to be in the film industry. This is what I want to be involved in. You know, and so I made that decision from that point on to commit to that. So I committed to that, acted for five years. And, you know, by that time, you learn a lot. You see, you've been on a lot of sets. You see how direct, different directors work. And you also see what it takes to get a movie made. And so I was approached to be in a movie, a small independent movie and the director was having difficulty getting a budget and so having me on board i was able to get an extra bit of budget i was able to get a bunch of my friends that were let's say a musician to do the soundtrack and i just slowly started to help put this movie together and then i became a producer on the film um, and just slowly put it together and after i did that i realized oh i kind of actually like doing that um, so it wasn't just about acting and performing but i actually like making movies you know and so then I kept producing. And to this day, I've produced uh, six movies and uh, Into the Badlands, a TV series. And then in 2006, I directed my first movie. So after producing a couple, I was like, I think I can direct now. And so I directed this movie called Heavenly Kings. Very strange movie. It's um, If any of you guys ever seen Spinal Tap, that was a movie in the 70s. It was about a fake heavy metal band. And they went and toured the country. And everyone at the time wasn't sure if they're real or fake. So we, we, me and a couple of my friends, this is when, like in the early 2000s, boy bands were really popular and we really hated boy bands. Like I hate manufactured music. I grew up with like enjoying, you know, like listening to punk music, hip hop, all this stuff that wasn't like overproduced and wasn't like manufactured. But boy band music was overly manufactured and it was taking over the world at that time. And so we wanted to make a movie like Zoolander that was um, kind of lampooned um, being in a boy band. And we looked at the budget and we thought about like, you know, there's scenes that, you know, with an audience there, it's expensive to try and film scenes with a huge audience, right? And so we decided like to drop it because budget wise, uh, we couldn't make the film. Then six months later, I woke up in the middle of the night and had an idea. I was like, you know what? 
I know how we can do this. We can become the boy band and we're going to film our exploits and not tell anybody that we're fake. And then we're going to make a movie out of this and release a movie. And that's when everyone will know what happened. So for 18 months, we pretended to be a boy band. We did three concerts. One concert was for 40,000 people. Um, this is a music festival. So we were jammed in uh, with a bunch of other bands and did this thing. And everyone, except for maybe a dozen people, thought we were actually a boy band for a year and a half um, until we finished the film, edited it. Um, so I edited it, produced it, directed it, um, and and released it at the Hong Kong Film Festival in 2007. Um, and then everyone, I remember I remember being in that theater, it was 2,000 people. There was this collective like, oh, that's what you guys have been doing the whole time. So yeah. Anyway, um, were you a popular? Did you have fans? Here? Yeah, were you a popular boy band? Your band well, had fans. Yeah, we had fans. We had fans because we were already known as actors before, okay. and a lot of actors in Asia sing and act, so it wasn't an odd thing to happen. Um, what, but what we did was we didn't sell any of our music. We gave it away for free, <laughs> and, and we were in concerts that were like not ticketed concerts. They were free concerts, so none of it. We were not taking advantage of anybody because when I grew up in the '90s, there was this group called Milli Vanilli. <laughs> who faked who faked their lip sync their albums and lip sync concerts and they got in huge trouble for it. So knowing that, I didn't want to get in that kind of trouble. And so we gave everything away because it wasn't about making money or or the music. It was about making a movie that talked about basically nowadays you could be a singer without know having to know how to sing because things like autotune and all that kind of stuff can make you into a pop star uh, without you actually being a, a singer. And so that the whole movie was a social commentary on on the, the entertainment industry and how fake it is. Um, but anyway, the point is, yes, going from an actor to a producer to a director, it was an organic process for me. And it was all based on stuff I learned being on set. And honestly speaking, like a lot of people ask me, like, should I go to film school to be a producer or a director? I mean, yeah, you can do that as well, or an actor. But if you have an in already and you're already, you can be on a set, you learn a lot more um, from from that as well. School is also important. Theory is important, all that kind of stuff. But the practical stuff you're going to learn and how to put a movie together and all that kind of stuff comes from being you know around and seeing it happen. So unfortunately, Lucas Dodson's screen has frozen. So he is out as an interviewer. But Kaylin, I want to give you a chance to ask a question, and then we're going to start looking at some of the audience members' questions. Right. Um, I guess I would ask, what advice would you give to someone that's trying to pursue an acting career? I would, okay, I have lots of advice for that. Um, one, one is um, make sure you know what you're in it for. If you're in it for acting and you like the way you feel acting and when you do a play or you do a scene and it makes you feel good, keep doing it, keep, crap, keep working on your craft, right? And the opportunities eventually will come when you get better. Um, if you're in it because you like fame or you wanna be a celebrity, don't do it because it's not worth it. It's not worth the pain and rejection um, because there is a lot of rejection in this business and you have to be ready for that. You have to be thick skinned and go, okay, I, I wasn't chosen for this, not necessarily because my skill set, or maybe it was for my skill set. I need to go back and work harder on it. Um, but you have to be able to be able to persevere. It's, it's, I would have to say, and I'm not to, I'm not over exaggerating. This is probably one of the worst, um, businesses to go into if you're if you have a self-confidence problem right because you need to have a lot of confidence to just a lot of people are going to judge you all the time and you have to have the confidence to go no you're doing what you think is right and go go through that um, but again if you're into it because you just want to be famous or you want to be a celebrity don't don't do it there's a lot of other ways to do that um, acting is 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 a difficult profession is enough as it is and so I would say you know the best thing to do is find a great teacher and keep working on your craft. And then after you get certain opportunities, those doors will start to open. You'll meet the right people and keep your ears open. You know, uh, agents are important. Managers are important. All those things. I don't want to cloud your mind with too much business stuff, but I want you to get the basics now is that you should really work on your craft and skill as an actor and practice as much as you can. Watch films, watch plays, understand and wa understand why it's good, why that thing made you feel good, and try to translate that into your own work. Is it fair to say that one of your crafts is martial arts? Is that something that you've been able to use throughout your film career? Sure. Form of expression. Sure, it's interesting because in the beginning of my career, I, I stepped away from it and didn't want to use that as a tool for my career because 
um, the first, I was managed by Jackie Chan for 11 years also. And so in that, that week that I met that director, that same week I met Jackie Chan at a party and uh, a friend introduced me to him. And within 30 seconds, again, actors that are struggling are going to hate me. He looked me up and down and asked me for my phone number. And then two days later, his manager called me and I went into his office and they basically took me on as my manager. And so, um, but I made a conscious decision in the beginning to stay out of martial arts because I met Jackie. I gotten to know him pretty well over time and I'd seen the pain that he was in. You know, he's broken every single bone in his body and now he's around 65 and he's in chronic pain. And I was like, I don't want to get old and be that way and be, you know, I, I have the first film I did was an art film, uh, art house film. Uh, the character was a gay character. So it was a lot of, it was challenging. And so I'd already established myself, started to establish myself as an actor and not necessarily as an action actor. And so I didn't want to get stuck as a stereotype or pigeonholed as that kind of actor only. Because I know a lot of, Jet Li, Jet Li I know personally, Donnie Yen I know personally, all of those guys want to do drama. They want to do comedy. They want to do other stuff, but they, they can't now because they've been doing that their whole life. And that's what audiences pay to see. They want to see them doing cool Kung Fu on screen. And so they don't really, no one's going to really fund a movie for them to do that. So I, early on in my career, I saw that and I go, okay, I'm going to do a lot of different things. So I can't be pigeonholed as one thing and just do whatever I want. And so later on, the martial arts skill ended up being helpful for me because when I did Into the Badlands, which you see that poster there, you know, it's a, it's a martial arts heavy show. And, um, you know, we, we need an actor. At first, I was just a producer. I was, we were casting for the role um, and I didn't put myself in, but we were looking for an actor who was experienced, who was internationally known, who was um, Asian and could do martial arts. And so it's a very small, and specific group there. And so I was able because of my background to fit into that category. So yes and no, I would say it, it was important, but I wouldn't say that I totally needed to rely on that, you know? Um, and I wouldn't say you have to, but if you have other abilities, they obviously can help your acting career. And so definitely use that. Like if you know gymnastics, that means you're a good mover. If you know how to dance, if you can do all those things, those are things that you can put on your resume to show um, that you can do all that stuff because some sometimes for certain films or certain projects those skill sets are necessary so lucas is back and lucas can you hear us i'm going to have you ask a car question and then we're going to go to the viewers questions yeah i can actually hear you guys now just transition on my phone so yeah like that's a quick question about cars because one of your many interests outside of acting is cars and cars restoration so what is it about cars that appeals to you is it the driving the restoration what exactly is it I think it's everything. I think it comes from um, my design background, but I've, I've, I've been in love with cars since I was 12. I had a subscription to Auto Week when I was 12 years old. I bought, I bought my first car before I even had my license. But at that time, cars represented something else to me. It was freedom, you know, because I grew up in Orinda. I went to Head Royce, so I had to have, rely on my parents to drive me to school every day or in a carpool. But once I got my license, it, I could do whatever I wanted. I could go see my friends whenever I wanted, so it represented freedom. But car design specifically to me what's so interesting about it to me is that it's like architecture as well i like maybe it, maybe it's i'm control freak. i like to have my hand in on controlling all aspects of something so like making a movie i like to be able to direct because i'm not only acting and doing that part but i'm also controlling what the movie is saying what the movie what's the message we're putting out you know um how the actors work with each other all that and car design is the same way um when I worked on my two restoration projects, I, I was able to make all the decisions I wanted to. And it comes from experience of designing, but also comes from experience of being a car user and going and having owned different cars in my life and going, oh, this car was great, but I wish this thing about this car was better. Or this car has great power, but the interior is terrible. You know, And so you start to build up an experience over time that once you get to the chance to actually build your own car, um, you, you know exactly how to approach it, how to attack it. But again, I use my architecture background again to um, to break down how to design the car and how to push it moving forward. For sure, that you... architecture degree was super versatile. So I want to make sure we get to a few audience questions. And um, Chloe and Kalen, do you want to read them and maybe pick a question that? And Lucas, can you mute? Uh, and maybe pick a question that we haven't heard yet.
and I'm also happy to do it. So while they're looking, I'm gonna begin. Um, Soraya, who is a 10th grader, and Noko, her mother, who's a teacher at the school, wants to know what it has been like being an Asian actor in the movie TV industry. Oh, um, it's been interesting because my, my career started in Hong Kong. And as you know, Hong Kong is, is all Chinese people. And so I was working in an industry where I wasn't a minority for 20 some years. And growing up in the United States, obviously I had minority experience growing up, but once I got to Hong Kong, it was an interesting experience for me because I felt like uh, this is like returning to the motherland and being with my people, being with my culture. But I also felt distinctly different because I was born in America and I grew up with different kinds of values and different ways of thinking. But I eventually found my way and I found, and, but in my business specifically, I never had to deal with race because you know, everybody was Chinese and none of the, the, the roles were written for a specific race. It was just written for actors. So I got roles based on my ability and not my race. Um, once I started working in the United States, then I became a little more conscious of that and realizing, you know, especially for me, I grew up in the 70s, 80s and 90s where I didn't see people like me on screen. So the part of the reason why I never thought of entering the entertainment business is because Growing up, there were not people like me on screen, so I never thought it was an option for someone like me. And it wasn't until that, you know, someone pulled me out of a bar and forced me into it in, in Asia that I actually thought that this could be a possibility. And then after doing it for 20 years in, in, in Asia, I finally got the opportunity to come back. And, and working here, it's been interesting because it is based on race sometimes. And, in, and actually, in some of my success now is based on the fact that Hollywood is global now. It's a global business and China is a huge market for them, right? And actually two years ago, the China box office for the first time surpassed the U.S. box office in revenue, right? So Hollywood looked to China as a huge source of money making for them. And so for them to, to have more successful movies in Asia, they need to put Chinese actors that are familiar to the Chinese audience to them in it. And so that's when I started to see a more interest in me. Uh, uh, to work in, the, in, in U.S. projects. And so uh, uh, the movie I did, Geostorm and Tomb Raider, are, are results of that. Um, and that's when it became you know, helpful for me. But I would say 10 years prior, it would have been difficult for me to try and break into the business. Um, there, weren't, there still weren't that many people like me on the screen. And it's only the past, I could say, five years that we were seeing more Asian Americans and Asians on, on American screens. So it's been interesting. It's been frustrating sometimes it's been difficult at times but you just have to persevere um, and push through it and I know to me now I have a different perspective it's like in Asia I was just working and representing myself because again I was saying I wasn't a minority there but now I feel like I have to represent for your generation now I have to represent for my daughter's generation to go when they see a movie on screen like she I, just, I took her to see the farewell because I wanted her to see you know a young Chinese girl Aquafina on screen on TV. I never saw that growing up. And so then I never had that idea in my head that I could be an actor. And so I want her to see that to think that there's no limitations for her. And so why I'm doing what I'm doing now in America is because I think the next generations need it. They need the inspiration. They need the motivation to go, yeah, I can do that too. One of our uh, viewers, Maya, who is a ninth grader, wants to know what was one of your favorite scenes in any movie? Um, that you have actually been in? What has been a favorite scene for you to star in? And I would also say, oh what are some gosh. movies that you just love? Oh my gosh, this is a, this is a difficult one because I have a you know big library of things. Um, Into the Badlands was a very fun project to work on for me because not only was I starring in it, but I was executive producing. We were, I was the one of the only Asian American male leads on an American TV show at the time. Um, and so we were very progressive. And then we're, we created the show out of nothing. Um, we, we had an idea to do an, a martial arts drama and bring martial, you know, Hong Kong style action to American TV screens. That was the, the simple goal. But what we ended up doing was creating a really uh, progressive show that was not only diverse, but really interesting story-wise, and then also had great martial arts on top of that. So you could look at it from all different levels. Like if you just want to see cool martial arts, yeah, that's that. If you want to see like a cool female heroic character, we have that. If you want to see diversity, we have that. Um, if you want to see intricate like Game of Thrones, uh, multi-layered storytelling, we have that. 
And we did all those things in this one show. And I think my favorite scene uh, was in season one, in the first episode, there's this fight scene. And like I said before, um, I, I haven't done a lot of martial arts in, in a lot of my work because I was trying to not be stuck at doing just martial arts. So I hadn't done you know martial arts on film in like probably four or five years prior to that. And I was already 40 at the time, so not a spring chicken. And um, this fight scene that we did was, it was we called the rain fight. It was in, it was on a set, but it was actually a street and it was raining and I'm fighting like five guys with a sword. And it took seven days to film that. It's raining the whole time, we're soaking wet. So it was very difficult. It was also freezing because we had to have like, you know, air conditioning on in there to make sure all the equipment stay dry and all that. So it was a very, very, very difficult scene, but it came out really beautiful. We pulled off all these kind of cool, uh, what we call stunt gags and tricks. Um, so action wise, that was probably one of my most favorite scenes. And also set the tone for what that show, what the level of action we're going to create for the show moving forward. And we got better as it moved on, as we got into season two and three. Um, my favorite scenes is probably from a movie I did in Hong Kong, um, and it's from a movie called One Night in Hong Kong. And uh, prior to that movie, I, I was when I first got into the business, I was considered like a pretty boy and I was being cast for like romantic comedies and things like that. But I, I like darker genre stuff and I wasn't being allowed to play that. And that was one of the first films that I was um, casted to play in. And I played this kind of like country bumpkin guy that gets hired for 500 bucks to go try and kill somebody. Right. And it's a very complicated story about uh, this 24 hours that this kid is trying to deal with. Um, and we had some really cool scenes with some really great actors. And I remember being just so happy that I was finally on a movie that I wanted to see. <laughs> That's great. So I realized that it's it's now 3.30 and you're you're so fun to listen to that we can <laughs> keep on asking questions. And um, and I just want to give our three interviewers a chance maybe for, you know, I yeah. understand some of the viewers might need to leave, but do you have a final quick question for Dan? Here comes yeah, I'll ask, I'll ask one more quick question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so aside from cars, do you have any other creative endeavors, especially like right now, that's kind of the thing to have or some sort yeah. of endeavors to pass the time? Do you have anything yeah. that's so, interesting you? You know, when often like people describe me as actor, producer, director, uh, entrepreneur or whatever, but I think of myself as a maker. I like to make stuff. So it could be from anything from making a card for somebody to making dinner, to making a movie, to making a car. So uh, recently I've taken on a couple of DIY projects in the home because you know we're all stuck at home, there's nothing to do. So I made, uh, I took like, my daughter's name is Raven and I bought this vintage like cutout R um, from an old sign for her. And it, you know, it, it originally at one point it had lights in it and um, those broke and I bought a second, it's vintage, it's old. And so I figured out a way, I ordered like LED lights off of Amazon and figure out a way to put LED lights in this thing so now it lights up, it's on the wall in their house. That's a small little project. Um, uh, I recently, yesterday, two, you know, last week, I changed the exhaust on my on one of my cars, the whole exhaust system. So I just, you know, I'm, I, I'm not the kind of person that enjoys like lying on the beach. I like to do stuff. I like to make stuff and create things all the time. And so whether it's, like I said, making a car, making dinner, putting exhaust on a car, I always have a ton of things to do. <laughs> For sure. Kaylin or Chloe? Um, I guess as far as like being like a really like hands-on person, I was just wondering like when it comes to like watching movies or watching TV, if that's something that you still enjoy since it's more about not really being hands-on but more watching or as an actor, is there any differences that you do while watching movies or TV? Yeah, it's it's hard now because and the same thing with architecture. Somebody told me when we started architecture school, they said, once you get through school, you'll never look at a building the same way. And that's what you do. You walk into every building and you look at all these details that most people don't notice. And the same thing, having been in the film industry for so long, that's what I do when I watch a movie. I start to pick a movie apart. You know, And it's very rare. And it, it takes a really, really good movie to just suck me in and not look at all that kind of stuff. And that's how I know that it's a really, really good movie. Um, but things like horror movies now are not scary at all to me at all anymore. And I can't even watch them for that effect because 
I watch it and I go, oh, that's how they did this. So this is how they achieved that one thing to scare you. Or, you know, you overanalyze it completely. And so I still watch them, but I'm not getting the same, you know, visceral excitement that most people get. I don't get scared by them anymore. Um, same thing with like scary movies or, 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 you know, mass murder movies, things like that. I don't get scared of it because I know that that's fake blood. And, you know, on Into the Badlands, we had gallons of it all over the place all the time. So I become numb to it. Um, yeah, so it kind of it does it does um, affect how you look at movies and plays and all that kind of stuff moving forward. But um, it still enriched my life. It, it just it just I look at it in a completely different way now than most people would. So Dan Wu, thank you. This was awesome, and you've given us um, a lot to think about, a lot to enjoy, and. I think that image of you as Geronimo for your first ever acting experience with the, the testicle necklace is something <laughs> I'm never going to forget. Um, and, and I do know that, you know, the, the, I think this might be the final question is that a lot of kids on the viewer chat said, what, what stuck with you from Head Royce? Like what about the Head Royce experience mm. do you remember or has, okay. has continued with you into your adult life? Okay. So, I have to say that in Head Royce, it was a really difficult time for me. That, that six years I was there was difficult because I came from a public school where it was a good public school, but I don't think the focus on academics was so, um, so much. And I felt so much pressure coming in. And I remember the first year, first two years of middle school, like I did terribly. And it just like affected my confidence. It affected how I felt people looked at me. You know, like it was the first time I felt like, oh, I'm being judged for not being smart, you know? And I felt a lot of pressure. but that said, I did find my way. Um, and what I gravitated to was like, okay, I'm going to be good at the things that the other people don't are not doing necessarily. And so like, I took as many art classes because I, you know, I started to realize like, for me, it wasn't necessarily about like doing well on tests and things like that, that made me happy. It was like finding a way to express myself. So I took photography classes, I took art classes, I took sculpture classes from, and then, and then when we got to junior and senior year, when we could choose um, like Japanese lit, for example, and starting to choose subjects that I could, I, I was personally interested, I started to do better. And so by my junior and senior year, I did really well at Head Royce. And then once I got into to Oregon, I finally realized the foundation that the education that Head Royce had given me, had given me so much because college was like easy for me. I remember my first year at a 4.17 grade point average and I got a scholarship that paid for my final four years in school. And so, um, if I don't, and I also remember very clearly taking writing 101 in, um, in college and, you know, you have to do group critiques of other people's papers and this girl handed me her paper and it was a five page paper written in one paragraph and she was from Hawaii and it was written in pidgin English. Right. And I was like, and I'd gone through the rigors of Mr. Enloe's English class, um, barely getting through that, but I knew how to write an essay, which was at least I knew you know, introduction, three paragraphs of support and a conclusion, like I knew those basics. And this person had not learned that. And I was just so shocked. And I, and, you know, I taught her how to write the, an essay and all that stuff. And I realized like, oh, my foundation of, from Head Royce, like everything I learned from Head Royce is totally applicable to everything I'm doing now. And so like this whole story I was talking about earlier of architecture building into, into acting and acting building into my businesses and, and everything else that I do in car building, blah, blah. I think Head Royce education also is an important part of that. Um, again, during the time I was there, I didn't necessarily enjoy it and I didn't necessarily thrive, um, but I was learning through osmosis from the people around me, from the great teachers we had. And, you know, sometimes you're going to think it sucks. <laughs> you know, sometimes you can get really frustrated um, because it's hard, but, you know, all that stuff is good experience for you for later on in life. And, and I would say that, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have the, the education I got from Head Royce. Well, on that lovely final note, I think we'll say goodbye to our, um, our live stream audience. Thank you for joining us today with Dan Wu, uh, really Thanks, incredible person. And I hope we can bring you back into the Head Royce community in other ways in the future. Um, Love to. You, you have a lot to share and keep on making during your time of sheltering in place. All right. So take care. And I'm going to stop the recording. Actually, let me see if I can stop recording.